Today we're going to talk about design for non-designers. Um, if you're a product person, product manager, product owner, maybe an architect, um, if you're touching uh, your products and having an output on the interface choices during the day, this is, this is for you. So we're going to keep this a little bit higher level. It's not going to be about data visualization. We're going to have some stuff in there about that, but there's some other tracks on that. Uh, I really want to focus this more on the strategy side of things. So, so let's jump in. Uh, this 10 seconds about me. Uh, I am a classically trained musician, and I eventually got into uh, design about 20 years ago, and now I'm focused on designing uh, data products and uh, analytics products. And uh, first thing we have to know about is uh, that design matters. So uh, if you're touching it and uh, having any type of impact on what's going to be presented to your customers, then you're actually a designer already. So congratulations, you all have a new title. So. Let's, uh, let's, let's figure out how to make you a little bit better at that when you come out of here today. <clears throat> so uh, high level, when I'm talking about design today, uh, again, we're not going to focus just on ink. We're going to talk about things like paper towel dispensers. Why is this up here? Um, the reason I like this paper towel dispenser is that I don't have to touch it. So if you've ever seen, there's a lot of different paper towel uh, interaction mediums out there. Sometimes you've got to wind the thing. Sometimes you've got to wave the hand. This one is great because every time I take a thing, it just spits out a new one, and I don't have to interact with it. So that's a, that's a design decision. Uh, same thing with ATM, uh, ATM machines that require me to take my card out in order to get my cash. What does that do? It prevents me from possibly leaving the card uh, in the machine. It's a little bit more secure. Uh, again, that's also a design decision. Uh, time machine. Uh, why do I have this up here? It's simple. There's an on and an off button. And so getting something as complicated as backup uh, down to a, a single button click for the consumer is, is difficult uh, to get right, but that is also a design decision. And uh, one of my favorite examples down here, that's, that's my mom, Rhonda O'Neill, is bill pay software. So this is going to get into when we talk, talk about workflows. Have you guys ever noticed how it's like you go into add a payee and you type in all the information, you hit save, and then like you go back to the main screen, it's like, do you think I might want to write a check to this person? And that's why I'm creating a new <laughs> payee in my bill pay software. So why do I have to go into another thing to click on something to go pay my mom? I just want to write her a check. So thinking about those workflows and, and not uh, necessarily about all the tech and the fact the payee table is different in the database than the check writing table and all this kind of stuff, um, these are all uh, workflow decisions. So all this stuff is kind of collectively what I'm talking about with product design. So. So what's the secret to uh, great design? Um, I like this Henry Ford quote. Um, the, the, the point here is that you have to become a problem finder and a problem solver as well. So a lot of times, uh, people hire designers. They'll call me to come in and solve a problem. And part of what uh, we do as designers is go in and figure out, well, what problems do we actually need to solve for? Um, because if you don't know that, it's very hard to uh, arrive at your destination. And you're like, oh, but I'm not a designer. Well, uh, you can become a design thinker. And so uh, there's a lot of kind of dogma around this term right now, and a lot of some of it's fluff, some of it's uh, solid. But I want to give you uh, a set of things that you can take away today and actually apply uh, like a self-assessment uh, to your own products. So <clears throat> and one of those, I, I like this Tim Brown uh, quote, the CEO of, of IDEO. I'll just let you read it. So the point here is stuff isn't magic. Uh, it's not a black art. Uh, these things, don't, we don't just go into the factory and bam, the iPhone comes out of the other end. Um, there is, quote, genius design. And maybe you know, one out of 1,000 times, you throw something at the wall, and it sticks, and it really sticks well. But the other 999 times, there's a lot of iteration, a lot of discussions, a lot of trade-offs, um, a, a lot of things that go into creating something that's good. <clears throat> so OK, what can you do about this today? So, uh, what I want you to be able to take away today is, is a set of questions uh, that you can ask yourself against your product to kind of evaluate where you are. And hopefully, these, these will help you at a strategic level. OK? So here's nine of them. Let's jump in. <clears throat> Number one, did you base your dashboard or your templates on, or did you base your design on templates? So this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but it's the wrong question, and I get this a lot. Should we use Tableau? Should we use you know, this BI tool? Should we use this one? Um, at some point, there might be a tech decision like that to make, 
but it's usually the wrong first question to be asking. So if you're just looking to visualize a set of data and you have no idea, you're not really concerned, like the data is completely useless without some visualization, then yeah, you can probably start throwing it to some different template engines and seeing what you get out of the other end. Um, my focus here is for, for people that are actually designing products that are going to be consumed by an end user. Uh, and most of the time, a template is probably not going to satisfy you. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the things that, that trips up a lot of people here is everyone, at least a lot of my clients that I have, everyone assumes that someone else spent a lot of time designing their thing. And what I find out is that everyone is copying everyone else's stuff. And you don't know why the design was necessarily right for them. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's right for your product. And so you can't always, you know, when someone asks you, well, what do you think of my product? It's like my first question is, well, what, what is the outcomes that you were hoping to have by providing this interface to people? And then I'll give you my opinion on what I th think about your design. But if I don't understand what outcomes you're supposed to walk away with, then at best I can sit here and poke at, oh, this color is wrong, or maybe you should try this kind of visualization instead of that kind of visualization. But you're kind of just poking at small stuff at that point. <clears throat> so. Number two, um, <clears throat> this crowd probably, you guys are familiar with this, but um, information overload is a design problem and not uh, a quantity problem. So uh, the way I like to frame this is that um, a lot, of, at least for some products, this isn't true for all products, but a lot of products you can increase the value by adding more information, but you need to have more care. You need to take more care with design as you're going to increase the amount of information that you're going to present to people. Uh, and so your consideration needs to go up for that. Um, so if you're going to plop new stuff into your product, uh, take care. And just remember, every time you're adding uh, content, you're increasing the amount of uh, information people need to process, the number of choices. And you're, you're actually diminishing the value of everything else that's in the product, because now people need to parse through choices. <clears throat> so number three, are you providing useful comparisons at the right time? So what do I mean by useful? So this is an example of something I, I worked with a company. Uh, do, 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 people in here know about uh, storage and I.O. and all this kind of stuff. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the term IOPS, for example. OK, so even if you don't know, the point here is this, is, this has to do with uh, in the data center. When you access data, um, it's, you're hitting the, the disk drives, the storage system, in order to return information. So this company um, built some software that basically uh, sits between the computer and the storage system, and it's, it's an in-memory cache. And so when a request comes in for data, it says, hey, do we have this in the cache? Yes, OK, send it back. And it's a lot faster if you serve those requests from this cache than if you go to the disk. It takes longer if you go to the disk. And so how did they express this on the, and the, the, the product was interesting, because you just, you plug it in, you turn it on, there are no settings, and it starts offloading uh, storage requests. And so the measurement of that from an engineering standpoint was how many IOPS of savings am I getting? And the problem with this is that the person that's going to use this, the data center admin, wasn't always the person that was going to purchase the software. And so how do you translate that you got 64,000 IOPS worth of savings? What does that mean? Like most people don't know what one IOP is, or they don't know how to quantify that to business value. So we explored talking about this in terms of, well, what's the equivalent number of disk drives that I would have had to buy in order to achieve the same performance had I not have that? Because uh, you know, it's, uh, a CXO or someone probably knows what it costs to buy storage. Uh, and so by translating that into a number that was a little bit more relatable, um, we totally changed the metric from IOPS to disk drives here. But the, the point here is that this is a more useful comparison that you can provide in an executive summary and say, hey, this product is doing this much worth of business value to us. <clears throat> so some other uh, possible things to think about when you're comparing, to, uh, comparing things in your product. So um, obviously, relevant uh, blocks of time. I see a lot of stuff where it's just like, pick any time period, and we'll show you the data. But did you think about business cycles or consumer cycles or whatever those stock cycles are? Um, Benchmarks, uh, sibling objects, parent objects, categories, uh, competitors, um, indices. Um, we, we obviously in finance you see that a lot, but there might be in, uh, re meaningful indices uh, within your own market that you could be comparing to. Uh, and then what I like to call magic numbers, right? So these are scales where you know golf has 72, you know, is par, and your credit score is 850. 
these are the magic these are magic number values and so if your industry or your your space has some type of magic number values in it you might be able to use those as comparisons to help people understand uh, and put their information into context so next one here is about um, <laughs> surfacing signal and reducing noise so um, Again, there's a lot of stuff on data visualization, so I'm not going to go super into this. Uh, but this is kind of level one uh, data visualization, which is just getting the data into table grids. You see this a lot. Um, this was another, um, actually, another storage pr uh, performance product here. And there's a, basically what this is, a list of virtual machines on the left. And there are basically six status indicators here. Uh, so there's about six pieces of information per row. And so the redesign uh, that we went with here uh, increases this to about 1,000 data points per row. There's, there's about 180 times more information uh, conveyed in this uh, with a lot less space and a lot, a lot more meaning. And so <clears throat> part of what we're also doing here is we're trying to, it, what's, what's going on here is this is uh, indicating your virtual machines that are having performance problems, so speed issues. And so what the, the way this company was selling itself is, well, we'll give you all these stats about your virtual machine and your CPU and your memory and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, that's actually not what people want to buy. Because if you're, a, if you're a data center administrator, what you want to do is get someone that's really pissed off at you to hang up the phone and say, thank you for resolving my problem. You're costing me money or time by my system running really slowly. So their goal is just help me figure out what's wrong so I can go and deal with it. So this product used a bunch of analytics to go in and say, first of all, what's happening in the last 72 hours? That's my proof that right now I do have a problem. The next thing that we learned a customer does through talking to people, which is an important part of design, is that the first thing they want to know is, well, is this normal? Because sometimes things are supposed to be hot. The backups run at 2 AM every night. Of course it's hot. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Well, the, having the additional amount of history for comparison gives me an eyeball glance like this to tell whether or not there's a cyclical pattern or whether or not this should be doing what it's doing right now. So that's a little bit of backup evidence there. And then the root, we provided some root cause analysis here, which is, OK, well, that's what's going on. That's the proof. On the right side, we're actually doing the root cause to tell you, well, this is what's actually wrong. Your CPU is waiting, or your memory is swapping, or whatever it could be, so that that person can then get on the phone and call the right person and say, hey, the reason your stuff is running slow is because x. Their goal was not to go in and use the product and click on charts and study the data. Their goal was to make an, a, a meaningful business decision to get out of their problem. <clears throat> so uh, next two things here. You've probably heard this before, but this is a common thing that I see with a lot of uh, products in this space, is just reduces the size of your stuff. And I think what happens, uh, your charts, your visualizations, a lot of times they don't need to be as big as they are. Uh, and I, I sometimes see this as a crutch because people, they don't know what to put on the screen, and so they just kind of make their main thing really big. And so I know it's scary, uh, but that you, that's usually signaling that either your product doesn't have a lot of value or it, it has the potential, but you haven't figured out what it should be. So just give some consideration to size. And then uh, I think it's funny that there was a kind of a moment of silence uh, from the last speaker. So we're going to have a quick one here for white space. And so the point of this slide is that part of the job of a designer is, is, or a design thinker, too, is to figure out what to remove and to take away. It's not all about additive and adding stuff and about, like, what should be bold? It's like, well, let's take all the bold out and <laughs> so that when we use bold, there's actually some signal that's being conveyed there. So thinking about what to take away is also important. So uh, number five, are you designing for everyone or are you designing for nobody? Um, so, you need to be optimizing uh, benchmark use cases here, or else you're probably going to become this spread of mediocrity for everybody. Uh, the product really doesn't make anybody happy. It, it takes a lot of work if you want to get some value out of it. But you can say, well, tons of people like the, this, this user and this persona, they can all get data out of it. But it's a pain in the butt to do that. So um, I would also uh, stress the value of going out and talking to customers one on one, doing interviews with people focusing less time on building stuff and writing code immediately and prototyping, and going out and figuring out what people's actual problems are. And I, it's, I, I'm even hearing, I'm hearing this more even in the, at the business level. I was half eavesdropping on a conversation a, about a vendor 
and, and the healthcare space talking about analytics and, uh, well, we need to know what the use cases are. And it's like, well, it's amazing. The designers need to know what the use cases are. The business needs to know what the use cases are. The architects need to know what the use cases are. But this is one of the things that I find is th the, so f not done a lot of the times is no one, I, oftentimes when I walk into a new product, I'm like, well, what are your top five use cases for this product? And they actually can't explain it. They can tell me every feature they have, but they don't know what the primary things that people do every day at 9 o'clock when they log into this tool, they can't tell me that. So it's like, well, then how can you possibly know if you're doing well or not? Yes, you can look at sales, but you have no idea whether you're satisfying somebody. It may just be that you're the only one that has this tech, and as long as you don't have a competitor, you're safe until someone comes out and figures out what people actually want to do, and they blow you out of the way, and now, now you're in the oh shit mode. <laughs> So um, this is just a quick way. Sometimes I, I, I work with clients to prioritize use cases. Um, so it's just a simple matrix here. But um, task frequency is one of the biggest things that you can be paying attention to if you want to increase usability. So the dots here and the actual tasks, these are totally arbitrary. I, I just made these up. The point here is more about the matrix, which is that um, look at overall customer value and frequency of use. If you can get frequency of use right, a, a, figure out what the high frequency use cases are and then satisfy those designs. It's the classic 80-20 rule. You're probably going to have some delighted people because uh, most of the time it's not like, I, I have these 100 things that I do with your product and I need them all to be great. Most people don't have that kind of ask. It's, it's a much smaller set of criteria and features that they need. So. Uh, this is a couple thoughts here for startups and also for, these are for companies that might have a, a brand new product, um, is figuring out if your MVPs uh, align with your goals. So again, this kind of gets back to the focus on uh, building constantly and then waiting for feedback. So I think it's great, although most places doing agile design are often missing the agility part of it, and they're also skipping the feedback loop part of it. And what they've just done is created short two-week development cycles minus all of the other part of Agile that was supposed to be about uh, iterating and not incrementally building. It's not build this part and then build this part and then build this part. It was supposed to be you build the whole thing at a low level of fidelity, and then you improve and iterate over that as you discover what's wrong with it. Uh, but trust me, it's so cheap to go out and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with six or ten of your customers. You will learn so much more than you will by investing time and money on engineers prototyping and building something uh, that you have no idea whether or not it's going to satisfy no one's need. It's just you have a, a, a hint. So unless you have a ton of capital, so maybe you can maybe you can do that. Um, Number seven, uh, does your product provide actual recommendations or does it require extensive eyeball analysis and tool time? So um, this is kind of this, I've been thinking about this maturity timeline as I call it for data products. And so on the left, we have data display and maybe that's where we were, I don't know, with early BI tools and some of this stuff. That, that first screen with the big X that you saw, I kind of put that in the data display thing, right? That's getting the stuff out of the tables and onto the screen. And to the left, we start. We move into information display, where the data is actually starting to become information of some sort. But it, maybe it has a fair amount of effort required. Eventually, you move into prediction, right? That's where it starts to get really fun. And on the far end, we always get, we get into prescription uh, and recommendation. And yes, it's very hard, especially for the engineers. I know how hard it is uh, to, to get this stuff right. There's so many variables involved with doing that, uh, and the effort goes up. So, so what can you do? Uh, when it's hard to get to prescriptive analytics and, and recommendations, focusing just on improving the design, if you're kind of at level one or level two, putting some really good effort just on uh, the information design and really thinking about, am I presenting data or am I pre presenting information? That can kind of get you from the left emoticon to the right emoticon, and eventually you can work your way potentially into the, the predictive space. Um, another thing here, and this is, this is from a, a, a well-known design evangelist named Jared Spool. He talks about tool time and goal time, and I use it with my, my clients a lot. So your goal should be to increase goal time for your customers and reduce tool time. So the goal is not to click on stuff, to import the data, to change the access to be this, to change the comparison, to put the overlay against the thing, to click on this other thing, to sort the table, and then export it to this tool, then import it. That's all tool time. At the end of the day, someone came in to figure out, like, should I do X or should I do Y today? Is this going to happen or is that going to happen? P 
people don't want to spend time on the tooling part of it. So obviously, th there's, this is difficult to get right, but if you spend time understanding what people's needs are, you can figure out where there's a lot of loops going on, where people are spending a lot of time just getting to the place where, like, OK, now I've got this screen or whatever, this workflow set up the way that the, the sales guy said it would be. They don't even probably realize they it spent an hour to get it going. I mean, you've all set up your home electronics or whatever when it didn't used to be as simple as just plugging the thing. It's like, I just want to take a picture. I don't want to set the time on the camera. I don't want to, like, I don't know what an f-stop is. I want to go on vacation and take some beautiful photos. So this is kind of the same parallel. Um, number eight, uh, another oft oft missed thing. Uh, how is your products onboarding in what I like to call the honeymoon period? So um, people, I, I think generally there's been a nice trend towards uh, time being spent getting set up and onboarding right. I think the tolerance even in business software has gotten a lot uh, lower for crappy onboarding experiences where setup is extremely laborious. There's crazy errors. You're on the phone with support. They want to unpack the box, or sometimes we call it the UBI, the out-of-box experience. Um, people care a lot more about this, but one of the most forgotten things is that honey, what I call that honeymoon period. So this is like day one. What does your product look like day one? Let's say your, your, your whole product is like, well, we collect history and analytics of time series data, and then we'll you know, do these uh, projections for you and that type of thing. Um, you need to think about what kind of experience you want to deliver during that one to, could be up to three months, could be the first couple of weeks. What are your, are the screens empty? Do you display anything? Do you tell people to just, to come back? Do you send them a notification when something interesting has happened? Do they need to do data imports? Should they be setting up other user accounts? The point is, is to actually design that experience that you want people to have uh, during both the setup but also that honeymoon period uh, as well. And it's okay if the answer is there is no value yet because we don't have enough data yet. We can't, we can't do anything. That's okay, but make that obvious to people and perhaps grab their email address or something and send them a notification like, boom, hey, we've just generated our first analytic. <clears throat> so um, number nine is, uh, have you designed for the right information uh, at the right time uh, with the right context? So um, this is kind of about part, part of the, the design thing is, again, not just the visuals, but we're also thinking about temporally about where someone is in an overall workflow. They, maybe they're doing a, a month-long project, and your tool is it has several different touch points along the way. Maybe you did the initial data import and you do some stuff. And then they go to this other tool and they spend two weeks doing something and then they need to come back to your tool to you know, post-process the data or do something else with it. You kind of need to be thinking about and mapping out those processes. And this is something you can really just do on a whiteboard with the people that know how the users are going to do this, or ideally with the customers. You can ask them, like, well, well, how long does it take to do that? And do you have to talk to someone in order to go do that thing when you take our data over there? Oh, yeah, well, first I have to ask the guy to do this, and then he needs to do that. And then we log into this other tool, and then we have to run backups on everything. But when that's done, then I go to this. Oh, so, and you can learn what their workflow is through that thing and figure out, like, what are the touch points that your product has along that timeline so that you can actually know how to interject yourself properly. Um, this is also, uh, <clears throat> we talked a little about uh, context here, uh, but this could be looking at people's historical use of the product. Uh, it could be looking at uh, location information, favorites, that type of stuff. Uh, and another thing is disclosure. And so um, banks love this kind of stuff. They love risk. I used to work, I worked at Fidelity and we had some serious legal reviews on every piece of copy that went on the retail website. Uh, but, but what that got me thinking about here is disclosure can also be explaining to, to where the holes are in your data. And I, I understand this can be a sensitive area where you may not want to explain exactly what the gaps are in your product. But sometimes it's important to elucidate where, you're, where you either have holes or factors that you haven't, uh, you haven't necessarily revealed, because they're, they're not secret to your company necessarily, but they might be important. Like, we didn't index to inflation these numbers, and it's not that we shouldn't, it's that we can't, but we need to let you know that when you're going to make a decision about this, stuff like that. So think about uh, kind of not, I don't want to call them the gaps in your information, but do you need to be disclosing anything that's not necessarily present there? So I'm, gonna go, I'm just going to go fast and, and summarize these again, because I want us to have some time for questions. But again, um, these are the, uh, the top nine uh, self-assessment things here again. So um, watch out for relying on templates. Um, Information overload is probably not the problem. It's probably a design issue. And are you providing comparisons at the right time? Are you focused on signal and noise? 
and especially increasing signal, obviously. <clears throat> um, do you have the elastic user problem where kind of this magic user kind of becomes this, the, the right person to solve whatever current project you're working on? Well, yeah, sometimes he wants to do that too, so that's a use case. Uh, watch out for that. Um, number six, um, have you, if, you're an, if you're a startup or a new project, have you actually aligned your MVP to your goals or are you working backwards from your technology and, and what it can currently do? Number seven, um, are you generating any actual insights uh, or, or are you generating just a lot of heavy tool time? Like what's that tool time tax costing your customers? Do you have a really great onboarding and a honeymoon experience, especially the honeymoon side? And are you getting right information at the right time with the right context? So if you're going to ask me for my slides, I can give you something better. If you just go here, I have a free, uh, a free guide for this. Uh, and it goes into a lot more detail on these, these nine things. So uh, just go to betteranalyticsproduct.com and you can, uh, you can get the guide for free. And like I said, I wanted to get to questions quickly. That's my contact information. Um, does anyone have any questions about design? <clears throat> Did you raise? Okay. So quiet today. Everyone's in the post-lunch coma right now. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on how to increase adoption of predictive analytics when people are used to um, calling things based on their gut or the you know the way we always did it? Where I guess I would turn that around and say, where did you find people didn't want? They wanted to do all the work to create their own decision versus potentially getting a prediction. I mean, that's interesting to me. I, I would think it'd be much easier to sell a predictive analytic than here's I, all this data. I would think so too. <laughs> that, wow. Um, I mean, I guess, I, are, are you getting this from end customers or like actual consumers? Uh, I, I work as a consultancy inside of a really large organization. Uh -huh. And so we're trying to you know, apply predictive analytics to oh. increase operational effectiveness, that sort of thing. And okay. people would rather, a lot of times, do it the way they always did it, as opposed to trusting a predictive analytic. And so it's not explicitly what you've spoken of, but I could see relationships. So I thought I'd ask. Yeah, I mean, part of, part of the design thing is there's, I hate to say it, there's, there's sales and there's relationships and we spend a lot of time proselytizing and getting consensus between stakeholders and that's part of kind of the design journey. So my guess there is either, A, you're disrupting a business unit. So people's jobs are on the line or, hey, just leave us alone. It's like, it's comfortable over here. We don't, so it's a threat. Um, it could be a trust issue. Like I don't, what's the risk reward, right? Like maybe if you're in a, a high risk environment, if you guys are wrong with the prediction, is it bad? And I guess I would say, well, let's look at what you're doing now and what that's costing either in, in human time or in financial time or whatever else it may be. Maybe they don't have a way to A, B. Like they can't visually see what the difference is, the val either the value or the risk if it's a risk issue. So I might position that kind of, I, I'd be wanting to get at what is the resistance factor there? Is it the disruption? Is it the trust factor in the quality of the information? Is the experience not good? Um, I, I should probably say something else too about like the importance of visual design. So someone was asking me about this and um, there is psychology, people pay more for stuff that looks nice. And it's not, that's not the only reason to do visual design, but there is a trust factor and you probably, you probably all kind of know this when you're shopping for various types of products that you might have a trust issue when you go and uh, you're, it could be a purse, it could be whatever it may be you're probably evaluating the quality of the product and your belief and, and the overall usability or the utility of that in part based on how it looks. And if it doesn't look professional, people are gonna question the validity of it. So again, not the only reason to do it because visual design is kind of part of this overall strata of just what we call product design. There's interaction design, there's human factors, there's usability. Uh, and a lot of times visual design for a long time kind of got the, well, that's nice, we'll find someone to make it look nice at the end. And gradually, people are having a lot less tolerance for stuff that looks poor, especially in business software. Uh, I've seen that change where it's like, 
no, this crappy, like, I do not want to use that. And the buyers are now, it's like they're used to their phone, like the apps look really great, the consumer, it's like, why does it have to look like that? I don't want to use that. Why, it's so clunky and it doesn't look trustworthy. So it could be like, I, I don't know how the analytic, how the prediction is made, but it could be the way it's presented is just not, it's not exciting, it's not believable, it's, it's a trust factor. So I don't know, those, I'd be trying to get at what the resistance is there and, and it's probably risk. My guess, yeah. A B two B thing that's ubiquitous. Yeah, it's. I I, I get this question sometimes. Oh. oh, okay. I can repeat the question if you like. Or go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I think it, let me, tell me if I'm rephrasing, uh, phrasing this correctly. Your, your question was, do I have an example of a well-known B2B dashboard that's doing something particularly well? Is, does consistently well or a good reference or whatever, multiple ones that you can think of. Well, I, I don't, and, I, and, and here's, here's why I don't in part A. It's often really difficult. So I actually put something on the discussion thread which was like, hey, post pictures of your dashboards. I don't know if you guys saw that on the O'Reilly thing and, and one, one actually student, a BI student, uh, put one up there. It's really hard to see some of this stuff because you don't, you don't have access to uh, B2B tools all the time. And the second thing is a lot of business to business tools, if you don't know what the use cases are, it's really hard to reverse engineer what the quality is. And, and this, uh, another thing I wanna say here is this focus on dashboards all the time, like yes, dashboards are important, but I would argue a lot of the time People aren't like, log into the dashboard, I use the dashboard, and now I'm gonna go off and make this decision. That's not probably what's going on. There's probably other stuff going on in the workflow before they can make a decision about something. So you need to think about the overall flow and not just necessarily what's on the dashboard. Like a lot of times, dashboard, just getting the signal, right? What should I be paying attention to right now? Give me the tip of the iceberg so that I can then go follow that thing. That's often in B2B space what I find dashboards really need to be doing is just surfacing the initial signal and then take me into the details of that. What are all the signals that matter right now? But it's not usually log in and leave. So I don't have a great like one dashboard. How about basic questions like how do navigation uh, you know, colored lines on black background or something reverse stuff like that? Basic building blocks of a good dashboard. Uh, well again, I, I think I would, I would say this, I don't think most people want to log in and look at your dashboard. Most people probably don't want to spend time in there. So I would be focused on what is the least amount of time and effort someone can spend in there, whatever that may be. So, I mean, these get into like kind of like graphic design issues and some of that. I can tell you, I came in here at 10 a.m. and I walked to the back of the room and I looked at my slides to make sure the type was readable, that the type size was right. The reason my slide is black is because I knew that they were gonna have these black things and the white background with the black thing is difficult on the eye because of the contrast. So there's tons of these tiny like lit graphic design decisions that go into that. And it, I mean, it's hard to summarize all of them, but you know when it's wrong and I hate to say it, but like the Spotify presentation earlier, the Intel presentation out there, if you were in the back of the room, there was so much text on the slides and they had blue on top of red and like pink. I couldn't, you couldn't read a lot of the content there. So. Thinking about context of use, I knew that there'd be people in the back of the room that were gonna try to read what was up here, and so there's, just, there's a lot of factors that go into the, the graphic design side. We can talk afterwards, because I know I'm, I'm close to, to, to done here. I don't know if we have, do we have time for any more questions, or are yes. we? Yeah, so we, yeah. I can just repeat it. So, Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, how to decide between the, what your client spends? Like, for one, this is most important. For the other, other thing is important. Sure. Yeah. Well, one. Yes, I will repeat the question. So, the question is, um, how do you decide what to put on the dashboard when you have multiple different types of of customers or stakeholders? So, you're sounds like, oh, we went out and talked to some people, and we got ten, ten different people, ten different answers. So, um, 
That may mean that you've not talked to enough people. If there's really that much delta, you might need to talk to more to listen to, for some trends to see if, uh, and sometimes you can do a qualitative, if you really want to get scientific about it, you can do 10, 15 interviews, look for some trends, and then a big company might invest in, let's do a survey based on the trends we heard from 10 to 15 to quantitatively validate that those use cases are actually being experienced twice as many as the other use cases that are there. That's one way to get a firm decision on it. Um, I find that the other thing too, when you talk to customers, the goal is not to figure out what they want. The goal is to figure out what they need. The goal is to figure out what they're going to try to do with the tool, and that is not usually stated to you explicitly. It's, it's implicit, and it, it can't, you, asking why is probably, if you could walk out of here with one thing on how to do good basic research, is just keep asking why until you ladder up to something, and you'll know why do you do that? Well, why do you click on this thing? Well, I need to get this data to my boss. Why does your boss, well, he wants to put in a presentation. Well, why does he want to do that? Because we're trying to get funding for our product. Oh, so what you really need is a chart that looks really good to justify the purchase of the other. Yes, that's what I need. So we call that laddering. And if you can keep getting up to that why stuff, it'll, it'll probably come out. And again, I would be very careful with going into research to figure out what people are saying that they want. You need to dig into the why behind that. Because you might find out there's actually more patterns there. Uh, and and the, other, the other issue with that is watch out for uh, clients and customers. When you say, what do you need? They start to think about what everyone else might need. And so everyone, else, everyone starts to become the designer. Well, I can see how some people might think that might be really valuable. And they might want to do this. And I would move the button up to the top because it'll be more visible that way. It's all conjecture. And now you have everyone thinking what's right for everybody else. And so the way we do that, it's like, great. Tell me about you, though. When you log in, what's useful for, for your thing? That's really great feedback. I appreciate it. We're, we're, we'd like to go study that some more. But when you do it, and you keep framing it back to them so that you don't have this constant you know, conjecture of what everyone else might think, that totally defeats the purpose of doing the, the research. So it's tough. I mean, we could talk some more afterwards a little bit if you want on that. Other <clears throat> questions? OK. Um, I, can, I can hear it, and I can repeat it. It's fine. Here, well. Yeah. Yeah. They tend to put the cloth on certain things if it doesn't match up with what they've got in mind. Okay. Thoughts on that? Yeah, so let me I, I can repeat the question. So, how do you work with designers who have a, a particular aesthetic or a brand? Now, is your question that they have their own personal brand or their, their own personal way that they want to do it, and that's the, the rub is that, is that you're disagreeing with the personal <clears throat> aspect of it? Yeah, it seems like they've got an idea on what the best aesthetic should be, what the company's style guidelines, things like that, but might right. not um, mesh with the best way to represent data as far as um, uh, types of charts, things like sure. that. Sure. I mean, so here's one way to think about it. All the stuff is designed on assumption, and I talk to my clients about this. You can hire me to come in and design on assumption, and I will give you my best guess based on my experience. There is a way of designing on fact, which means we go and we actually test these products. We put them in front of people, we run them through scenarios and tasks, and we evaluate, can they use it or not? Can they get the, the conclusion that you want them to get or not? That's how you settle those types of debates. Some places, if the boss wants it blue and the boss wants the button there, it's like sometimes the answer for designers is, let it fail. Get a, let's see if we can get agreement to go and test it and, and make a fact-based decision on it. And if you can go and do that, that usually settles the debate. Uh, but you're, you're getting into an opinion versus opinion kind of thing there. I would watch out for designers that are really artists. Uh, design is not about your personal opinion about what things should be. You really need to take yourself out of the equation and think about what your, your stakeholders are looking for, what your customers are looking for, what's right for the product. So, could be a little bit of a maturity issue there or a you know, personal agenda. But I would say testing, it's like, fine, let's run with that. Could we, could we put this into the backlog of use cases to do a usability study on it and see if we can get some facts to back up the decision? <clears throat> All right, 40 seconds if I'm correct. Naomi's keeping me on this, so anyone else? We yeah, have 30 much. seconds. <laughs> a bell's going to ring any second. Any time. OK, well, it's OK to be done. Oh, one go, more. Go ahead. OK. A certificate. Yeah, um, like uh, WWW or somebody gives a certificate. I can talk to you. Yeah, I mean, there's 
there's, oh, good catch. There are schools and programs that have you know, human factors and design programs. Right. Uh, a lot Designing of. for analytics, some kind of certification. I don't know of any like schools, but you know, Julie, who just came in, is speaking next, and she may know more about whether that's true or not. So, any questions? You got my information there. Thank you for uh, for listening to my presentation. <laughs>